I think we actively benefit from poverty. Not because we want to, often it's unwitting. I've just become so um, un uh, tired of anything that lets us off the hook. You know, it's like, oh, there's all these millions of poor folks in America and like it's no one's fault. You know, it's, it's history, it's structure, it's their fault, you know? And I think that I'd like us, you know, often we talk about personal responsibility when it comes to poverty. And I'd like us, who are not poor, to take some more personal responsibility for this. And I think that doing that helps build up a political will. And a lot of us are willing to do it for like the guy that's a little richer than us, you know? Like if that guy up the ladder would just, you know, do more. Like that, that's, but I, I think that that's a really hard way to build a political movement. And I think the more of us that can get some skin in the game and kind of realize that we're connected to the problem and the solution, I think it can really matter, yeah. So I'm, I'm puzzled whether we're really overtaxing or it's just really somewhere else. I think that um, a lot of times the tax debate is about brackets or certain deductions, right? It's like, should the brackets be higher at the top end? What's the ideal, you know? And I think that's a really important debate. But I wish we had more of like an enforcement debate, actually. You know, like the chairman of the IRS last year went in front of Congress and reported that we lose over a trillion dollars a year in corporate and family tax evasion and avoidance. And so even if just a fraction of that was coming in more, we could do a lot, we could do a lot better. The reason I know that the mortgage introduction doesn't do anything to support home ownership, because the biggest barrier to home ownership, of course, is the down payment and makes our homes more expensive than they would be without it is through economic research. I'm very indebted to your field for that finding. And if you look in the government data, you realize that mortgage interest deduction, it's, just, it's not a middle class tax deduction. It's really a tax deduction that flows mainly to the top 20%. And so a lot of these things, when you th they're talked about in the abstract, they seem to be okay ideas. But when it comes to the brass tax of who's benefiting from them, it's really, it's really not the middle. So um, I, I was stunned by a quote in your talk today that I hadn't found in the book that we, you, you said, capital, we want the capitalism we deserve, yeah. Um, yeah, or, or capitalism for all in some sense, I guess. Um, the, um, I think that's a very good way to put it. It's also a call then for us to work on a kind of a governance system where we, we put poverty uh, first and foremost again, rather than just making excuses. So I understand that, and I, I think I'm, I, I'm willing to accept the blame that I'm not active enough. You know? um, but I'm also puzzled, now as the economist again, what will really be the best solution? Or what will be the right package of solutions? I, let me put it this. I don't think there's like a single answer, probably. Um, one is we need to transfer more and we need to help uh, those who've fallen, help them up. But then take another foreign country, China. It probably had the best anti-poverty success anywhere in world history um, um, with lifting about 250 to 300 million people out of poverty over two and a half decades. At the same time, inequality rose tremendously. So you could just as well in China say that the rich have benefited way more than the poor, but we still achieved poverty reduction. So there is something about poverty and inequity that means you can actually activate the poor, you can give them the right opportunities, and you might suffer an inequity consequence, but maybe be accepted. I don't think that's like a thing we have to accept though, right? I mean, the war on poverty and the Great Compression, which is kind of this wage compression, I'm using a economist term to show them that I'm cool, um, <laughs> that, we, that we saw in the 1960s and 70s, right? You got massive poverty reductions and massive inequality reductions. But it is true that the book does not take on the inequality debate. You know, and I think that you can end poverty in America and still have a ton of inequality. And that's kind of a, a problem that the book does not take on because it's kind of singularly focused on poverty abolitionism. But I don't think this is a bundle of goods we have to always accept. That you know, I think there are ways you could do it that reduce the results in 
inequality, but I think that my way of doing it, especially with the, the idea of like certain tax fairness and tax, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, tax collecting basically, would result in a kind of a, a lifting of the floor and a kind of a, a more regulation of the ceiling. I don't like the term redistribution because I think it sounds scary and it, it like unfair, like the government's like t going into your pocket, but the government's actually like playing a lot of defense for the pockets of the affluent. And it's my ask of us to like take a bit less from the government to that. Now, what does this mean? Like, what does this mean? So it often, I, one place to start here is by talking about taxes differently than talking about our role in taxes differently. So every time taxes runs around, no matter our politics, this is how we talk about taxes. Shit, I have to pay taxes. That's how we do it. But what if the next time, like, your buddy leans over the fence or you're having a backyard barbecue and someone's like, oh, gosh, tax time. What if the next time you were like, you know what? I know. It's crazy. Check out my house. I get the mortgage interest deduction on this thing. And there are over a million public school kids that are homeless in America today. So you know what I did this year? We donated our deduction to our local eviction defense, and I wrote my congressperson being like, you should probably wind it down for people like me. That's an awkward conversation. <laughs> but it's like, that's kind of how we change the social fact or the common sense about this stuff. So that's one place to start. Uh, in our school system, the, the property tax pays most of the, the schooling programs. So, so not the income tax. Anyway, the, the, uh, let me get a little further on, on this. Um, just to probe uh, what, we, what the whole package might include. So they, the... Your take on things, on, on uh, how poverty can be humiliating for economists, how it can be just a waste, that people and talents are not activated and not participating. And it reminded me a lot of a book from about um, the 90, 1990s by Amartya Sen. He called yeah. development is, uh, a, the title was Development is Freedom. Right. The idea that you, you give people opportunity, chances. And, and it, it takes more than just helping them up when they are in need with government transfer programs. I know yeah. you don't like the word, but anyway. Um, it, it takes thinking smartly about how do we get the, the young among the poor, uh, how do we get those who have temporarily fallen into hardship back on their feet and, and provide the right opportunity. So for kids, um, uh, you know, one of the things my property tax probably pays, and I'm super happy about it, is the, the schools in my district, they have a, a free breakfast and lunch program now. Right. And it's for every kid, so the stigma right. is removed. Yeah, I love that. Um, and, and so they have the chance of participating fully in school. They're not coming in hungry. Uh, and so th it's these kinds of things th th where we activate everyone that I think need to be part of the answer right. to reducing poverty. Right, and so what we do now, right, is we often say these are targeted programs, which means that if you make a dollar more than the income cutoff, you don't get the benefit. And this creates this massive tension between the poor and the working class. Because a lot of folks are like, I'm too rich to get a housing voucher and I'm too poor to get a mortgage, where am I in this story, you know? I can't, I can't apply for Obamacare, but you know, the cost of insurance is killing me, you know, and so I think that designing these programs with this kind of bigger tent targeting makes a lot more sense. So I, I love this idea, right? And so we saw this in COVID with the extended child tax credit, right? Extended child tax credit gets rolled out. It's massively impactful. It's like the most important thing we've done to reduce poverty since the Great Society, right? It reduces child poverty by about 44% in six months. The benefit flows to poor families, yes, but it also flows to a lot of working class and middle class families. Probably a lot of us got those checks, you know, if we have kids. And so these are the kind of programs that I think that we should be designing in mind. We want programs that really are at the, the scale of the problem. We want to dose it to the degree that it needs dosing. We want programs that are funded by tax fairness, I think, and they're not divisive. You know, programs that can, broad coalitions can get behind. And then, um, well, I think what strikes me most recently and also in your book is that probably housing and poverty and homelessness and poverty are intricately related. Um, it's also how we, I think, perceive it most here in California. The, yeah. the homelessness is just increased uh, visibly for everyone. Yeah. Now, 
That's beyond your book, but um, it turns out that one of the cities with the lowest homelessness rate is Houston, right. Texas. And, and what they have is basically no zoning laws. Right. Um, so how, this is, however, not really federal policy. So, so it's, we, we can talk about many of the redistribution programs, activation programs, but many of these things are pr basically local. So in my neighborhood, there is a, 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 a laugh, but not because it's funny, because it, the name is Fairbanks Ridge. Um, you might know that Fairbanks Ranch is uh, part of the Rancher Santa Fe that, uh, that's not uh, subsidized housing. Um, and um, and they, so they call it Fairbanks Ridge. And, and it's, it's in the middle of a basically single home neighborhood, um, uh, an apartment uh, complex. And the kids go to the same schools. It's, it's very integrated. But it's super local. Yeah. Um, so basically, does it mean this is a call to action? And in every local municipality and community, we need to work for this? Because it's not an easily mandated federal program. So is this a question about zoning laws? Yeah, so how do we build this up? Do we, every little city, we need to have new zoning laws. Everyone like Houston. Um, Houston's the Wild West. You can, there's like a horse farm next to like a pharmacy and stuff. It's really interesting. But what you get from that is it's the fourth biggest city in the country, and it's way more affordable than all of our other big cities. And a big reason why is because they don't have any zoning laws. The C Houston has had a, over 60% reduction in homelessness over the last 15 years. And one of the reasons for that is the affordability of the city. And another reason for that is this federal law that mandated something called communities of care, which says all these different service providers need to work together to get federal aid to house, house the homeless. And in Houston, they somehow took that really seriously. And they like just delivered on that community of care. A new book came out last year by Greg Colburn that's called Homelessness is a Housing Problem. And it's very, it very methodically shows that what matters is not drugs, it's not mental illness, it's, it's rent. The higher the rent, the higher the homeless, period. And so I think that, you know, in California, if you want to get a hold of your, your homelessness problem, you have to be serious about housing. And even if the federal government suddenly gave you billions of dollars to build, where are you going to build it if you have all these zoning laws that only allow you to build in these very small spaces? And so this is, this is one of the big games afoot, I feel. And so it matters for everything with respect to housing. So... Think about the debate about gentrification and how weird that debate is, right? It's like, well, if you, if you build in this neighborhood, isn't it going to gentrify? Well, that's only because we're only having that debate because this really affluent neighborhood, the rich, this rich one, whatever it was. Fairbanks. Yeah, Fairbanks Rich. This affluent neighborhood and this one and this one and this one and this one have been so successful at building a wall around the community that only these neighborhoods are actually susceptible to development. And then we have we pit like folks that have housing but are barely hanging on to it to folks that really need it, and that's a ridiculous thing to do. And so I do think this is a way that local power can really get involved in in fighting poverty. And this this is something that's about laws and elected officials, but it's all, it's really about us too, because segregation is perpetuated not only like by history and in the legal sphere, it's perpetuated at soccer games, you know. And at meetings like this, and when you run into your buddy, you know, and you say, yeah, did you see that proposal? Oh, my God, we're not going to do that, right? And so I think that it's, you know, this is, again, we have to shift the common sense of what we're, what we're for. Mm -hmm.